Good morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is wonderful for us to be gathered together in this, this holy place, this sacred space this day. Uh, and, and to see you and to begin meeting you and for us to begin getting to know each other and to build relationships that hopefully will last a very, very long time. It's good to be among you. If you are watching with us on live streaming, we're glad that you are able to join us this morning. And I would invite you, wherever you are, to find a candle and to prepare your place and, and make wherever you might be sacred space as you join us in spirit here this day. We continue to um, try to figure out what's the best way for us to move forward. Some of you over here may be able to see it. We have a, a big plexiglass sheet here, uh, so I don't have to wear a mask while I'm standing here. I can, I can see you and you can see me very clearly. Uh, these are one, this is just one of the things that's come from our continuing conversations about what can we do uh, to make worship more inviting, more personable, uh, safer for all of us. And we will continue to move forward as we begin to add opportunities for continuing spiritual formation, small groups, uh, fellowship opportunities, and certainly want, we want to do that. Uh, with, the, with the main goal of keeping each other safe. And so that is what we will do. But it's good to be here today. I'm glad that, uh, that we are able to gather here. It's a wonderful first step. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship. Let us pray. 
New every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long you are at work for good in the world and in us. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and to devote each day to your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare to, to, um, to join together in our first hymn, and you are invited to sing softly into your mask, you may remain seated to do so. Uh, the, the, the accompaniment was recorded earlier this week, and there are a couple of places where there are some little technology glitches, those kind of things happen, and the music may just drop out for a second continue to sing, and we will lift up our hearts and make a joyful noise together. Two thumbs up. Yay. Good, good, good job. We, we made it. Um, so we prepare to hear our text this morning. I'm, I'm going to make a little bit of a confession. It's how you get to know people real quick, right? You just sort of put it out there. When I was growing up, I was one of those people who was always at church. You might be one of those people, too. Uh, if the doors of the church were open, my parents were there, and consequently, I was there. My sister and I were. Some of you may have had a very different experience than that. Some of you who may be joining us online this morning may just be thinking, maybe I'll give this church faith thing a try. This may all be very new for you. So we come from a wide variety of, of experience as we gather here this morning. But even with all this time when I was in church, if you would stop me when I was young and ask me what it meant to be a Christian, what it meant to be a, a Jesus follower, 
I'm pretty sure I would have struggled to come up with an answer. If you had pressed me really hard and said, no, I, I, I want you to answer that question, based on my observations growing up, I would have had to say, well, I guess it means um, you say a prayer before you eat, right? I guess it means that you can't sleep in on Sundays. Yeah, well, if you're watching online in your jammies, you know, that's a good thing. Um, you're here with us. I, I guess it means that, that you don't smoke, that you can't go to certain movies, and you don't go to movies at all on Sundays when I was growing up. You can't drink certain beverages, and you shouldn't use certain words. When I was growing up, that was sort of the parameters of, of, of what I understood it meant to be a Christian. That's what I had pieced together about what it means to be a disciple. The best I could tell it meant you do this, you don't do that, you always go here, you never go there. You wear this, you don't wear that, you believe this, you don't believe that. That was my earliest impression of the Christian faith. Nobody ever said that to me explicitly. It's just sort of what I observed by osmosis. Being a Christian was all about learning and following the rules. And there are a lot of rules. Some of you might have had that kind of experience growing up as well, and that may be your experience even now. I mention this because in our gospel text this morning, somebody approaches Jesus, and this person is an expert in the rules. You've probably heard of the Pharisees. They were the, the ones who knew the Old Testament law inside and out. And if it comes across as if I'm, I'm throwing shade on the Pharisees, understand that I am a recovering Pharisee myself, okay? I'm an oldest child. Um, I know the rules. I always felt that rules were meant to be obeyed. My sister always believed that rules were meant to be broken. It was just the difference in the two of us. So we hear this from Matthew 22, 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. These two commandments, another translation says, are pegs. I love thinking of them as, as pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs on them. There were two kinds of authority in Jesus' day. First, there were the, the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the priests. They were the people who hang out around the church, the temple, made sure everything was ready for worship. They made all the decisions about everything that happened in that place. And the other leaders were the Pharisees. Now, if the Sadducees are, are the priest, then the, the Pharisees are the religion professors. They were the experts. They, they knew their stuff. The Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't like each other very much. But they had one thing in common. They really didn't like Jesus. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. That kind of, that kind of thing. That's where the Pharisees and the Sadducees are at, at this point. 
He was out there preaching and, and he was teaching and, and he was drawing big crowds. So they decided, okay, it's time. We're going to trap him. We're going to back him into a corner. We're going to get him between a rock and a hard place. And so by the time our text picks up, the Sadducees have already had their opportunity and Jesus escapes their trap. If you have an opportunity this afternoon or, or sometime this week, take your Bible and back up a little bit and, and, and read what, what's happening before we get to this part of our text, to this 34th verse. So the Pharisees saw what had happened, and they decided, now it's our turn. So when this Pharisee comes up to Jesus, he knows exactly what he's doing. This is not an, an innocent inquiry. It's a, it's a trap. He's setting it. So he asked Jesus, which law, which, which one of these rules is the most important? And when he asked that question, he already knows the answer. He knows that all of the rabbis in his day would say that you can't elevate one commandment over the other. If you do that, then that will that will compromise the integrity of all of the teachings, all of the law and all of the prophets. God gave them, and they're all intended to be equal, is what they would say. He knew right then and there that Jesus couldn't pick one over the others. So he strolls up to Jesus, and he says, Okay, if you're so smart, tell me. Which commandment, which one of the rules is the most important? And so Jesus quotes from what we call Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. And he says, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second most important commandment always travels with the first. You can't separate them. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. And this is why that was so brilliant. This comes from an, an Old Testament passage known as the Shema. And it's, it's sort of like our knowing our creeds, the, the foundational affirmations of, of who we are and, and what makes us followers of Jesus at our very core. For the Jews in Jesus' day, it was their affirmation of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then these words flow from that affirmation. And so the Pharisees can't possibly say that this isn't important. There's already a, a precedent for raising these words just a little bit above the rest. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing here. He says everything else is based on these two commandments. That translation it is from the message, paraphrase, um, um, translation. They're the pegs on which everything else hangs. There's 613 commandments, 613 laws, 613 rules in the Old Testament. Your memory may be better than mine. I can't remember 613 rules. I can remember two. I, 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 can, I can do that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I got that. I can do too. And all of those other 600 and, and whatever, so one way or another, align themselves with one or the other of those two. And all I have to do is, does this fit here? There must be a law about it, but if it has nothing to do with loving, loving God and loving neighbor, then it's probably not one of those things that's considered a law or a commandment. The common denominator between these two that are foundational to our faith is love. 
This is important because Jesus is telling us that, that the core of our faith is not about rules. It's about love. I thought rules was what faith was about when I was growing up. But love isn't about rules. Love is about relationship. Love God. Love each other. You'll hear me talk over and over again about this call and this claim for us to live a cross-shaped life, to love God with all our, our mind, our soul, our heart, our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. This is what it looks like to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. That's the bottom line. When I found out I was being appointed to serve as pastor at, at Surfside, of course, the first thing I did was go on your website. You know, that's what everybody does. You check out the website, you check out their Facebook pages. That, that's sort of how you, you sort of see who people are. Uh, Instagram, all those good things. And the first thing I noticed, the first thing that popped up was your mission statement. I guess now I say our mission statement. Living the love of Jesus. And I thought, boy, I can do that. That sounds like a place I want to be. That sounds like a, a people among whom I want to serve. You see, that's not something some committee somewhere dreamed up. It goes right back to Jesus' words that we heard this morning. Here at Surfside, we have said that being a disciple of Jesus begins with loving God and then living out that love by loving others. It means that in my life as an individual or, or as our life together centers right here in this place, this one place that Jesus himself said was the most important part of being a follower of his. So it doesn't matter which worship service we attend or which Sunday school class or small group we're part of, whether or not we're here every time the doors are open. This is the peg. These are the pegs on which everything else in our life together hangs. Everything we do, everything we do should hang on one of these two pegs. They should be helping us grow in our relationship to God or in our relationships with our neighbors here within this part of the body of Christ and beyond our walls. Living the love of Jesus is impossible, the living part, until we get the loving part right. Loving God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind means bringing our whole selves into this relationship. The good parts, the bad parts, the ugly parts, God invites us to bring it all with us. And then we can trust God to take what we have and use it to do what God needs to be done. I heard somebody say once that the best way to love God is to love the people that God loves. That may not be the best way, but it sure is a good one. David Brooks highlights the challenges to, to this kind of living that we are called to in these days. He says, it seems the smarter we get about technology, the dumber we get about relationships. We live in a society in which loneliness, depression, and suicide are on the rise. We seem to be treating each other worse. And I'm going to go off on a little mini rant right here. All you have to do is look at some people's social media accounts and you can see that that's true. 
The guiding moral principle here, he says, is not complicated. Try to treat other people as if they possessed precious hearts and infinite souls. Everything else will follow. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And everything else will follow. Are you? Are you loving God with all your heart, with all of your, your passion? Are, are you loving God with all of your soul, your, your deepening prayer life? Are you loving God with all your mind, your intelligence? God didn't tell us to check our brains at the door. God expects us to use them. Are you loving your neighbor, including those with whom you disagree, as you love yourself? If so, that's great. That's wonderful. You're, you're maturing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you're not, you may need to check your pegs. I hope you'll spend some time thinking about this this week. I know I'm going to. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God does invite us to bring all of who we are to his throne of grace and mercy. And that is part of our offering. If you have prepared an offering, uh, you may have left it in the basket as you came in or you may leave it in the basket as you, as you leave. If it's not prepared, you might want to take this opportunity to do so. If you're joining us online, you may want to, to go to the church website and you can make your offering that way or prepare it uh, in these moments to bring by or to send in to the church this week. Let us now offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Your soul. 
As we come together in prayer today, we each come with concerns and needs on our hearts. And so I invite you, if you have an unspoken request this morning, would you just lift your hand? Just sort of as an acknowledgement of, yes, there's, there's something I want to pray for. And we'll be praying with you for these unspoken requests. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we gather in your presence, we know that you have been waiting for us, eager to hear what we have to say, to know us as only you can know us. And so in these moments, we lift our joys, our concerns, our needs to your throne of grace and mercy. We pray, gracious God, for those who are ill or infirm of body, of mind, or of spirit, that you will meet each one at the place of their deep need. We pray for those who travel in these days and ask that you would watch over their comings and their goings. We pray for each unspoken request in this place and, and around the world this day that you would know and, and attend to each one. So now hear us as we lift the prayers of my lips and the prayers of our hearts together. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be Thank you. 
As we prepare to leave this place and go into our fields of service among our neighbors, we remember that we do not go alone, but that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with us and remain with us this day and forever. Amen.